morning, everyone. Welcome to Cumberland Homesteads Baptist Church. We hope you've had a great week. Today is about uh, Christ. Today we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Um, Old Testament Sabbath was on Saturday. And something peculiar about uh, the New Testament churches, they started gathering and meeting on Sundays. But it was because they believed that Christ physically rose from the dead on Sunday. And so we continue that tradition that was handed down from the first centuries, I believe the apostles themselves, and declaring that Christ is alive and ruling and reigning, and one day He will return to get us. And so, in other words, we celebrate Easter every Sunday. Um, and it's not, not just that one time a year, but every Sunday. Brief announcements before we begin. If this is your first time visiting with us, we hope that you feel welcome here. And you are a special guest. Uh, you'll notice in your bulletin on the side here, there's a perforated section. We ask all of our first-time guests just to fill that out, put that in the offering place as it comes by, so that we can have a record of your visit. We hope that you are encouraged here today. Other announcements, you'll see that there's a baby shower coming up. I can't wait to hold this, this little fella. Uh, I, love, I love babies. Love babies. And uh, this is for Caroline. And uh, Matt and baby Miles Jones. And it is September the 16th here at church. It's a Sunday. And it'll be from 2 to 4 p.m. You can see where they're registered. There, this is their first little one. So let's, let's do our best to help them and encourage them. And you know how it is. You, you, it's like, you ever went on vacation with a baby? You just, you have, there's so much stuff. And so let's, let's help them get that stuff um, so that they can... Uh, sleep well, they won't sleep at night for a while. Um, but uh, let's do our best to help encourage them. And so remember that, don't forget that. And then also, you'll see that there it is, we're working on an in house directory. And so there's this insert in your bulletin. We're asking you to update your information. If you're a member here, please fill that information out and provide a picture. Um, you can email those pictures uh, to homesteadspc at gmail. And then you'll notice as well that we're starting our visitation ministry this week. Um, actually, our training is tonight. We're not starting the visitation. We'll give out uh, contacts next Sunday. Um, but if you are interested in participating in our visitation ministry, I, I just want to be clear. If we're going to reach this community, it's going to take all of us going out and trying to reach people. I mean, if we want to do ministry the way the New Testament did ministry, they went out shared the gospel with folks, got them saved, brought them, baptized them, and they were part of the church. Right? And the Great Commission is, is, uh, is to go into all the world, baptize them, repent in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're to make disciples of all nations. And so and that's we. That's not, that's not just the church staff. It's not just the deacons. not just the Sunday school teachers. It's all of us. And so I want to encourage you to reflect on that reality. This is going to be an opportunity for you to be involved in that. We're going to offer a training tonight. And... Um, Miss uh, Linda Ferris is going to share tonight. She's been through uh, Evangelism Explosion. And it's, it's pretty, you need to, I, th I reckon she's taught Evangelism Explosion and, and some other things as well um, over the years. And uh, so she's probably one of the most trained in our congregation for personal evangelism. So I want to encourage you to come out tonight. Um, we're we're going to have normal worship at 6. And then at 7, we're going to start this evangelism training. We'll go to about 7.30. And um, if you are interested in participating in this visitation ministry, though, I need you to sign up in the foyer as you leave. And as you, or if there's a sign-up sheet there, there's a sign-up sheet down near the Sunday school. Right? So it's on the bulletin board there. Um, but I want to encourage you to sign up. Uh, we're going to provide contacts. You can read that in the bulletin and how it's going to go. Um, but we're going to, basically, if you'll have a team leader. We'll send out teams of three. And um, you're just going to, Knock us home and hey, we're from Homestead's Baptist Church. We wanted to know if we could talk with you about Jesus. And if they say, no, now's not a good time, we'll just, you'll have a bag of goodies or whatever, and you'll hand it to them. They'll have a track in there, and you'll just invite them to church. And if they let you in, you'll talk with them about Jesus. I mean, it, it, it really is that simple. And if they say, no, not right now, you'll go to the next contact. Uh, it, 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 church, I honestly believe that the Lord will bless if, we, if we're just willing to go. And not only that, but you, your team will go out at your convenience. This is not a specific night. It's not a specific time. Each team will set a specific time that they can go. 
Right, so I want to encourage you to participate. I want to invite, uh, welcome our visitors. If you've been here a visitor and you want to participate in that ministry and help this church grow, sign up. Come participate. All right, if you're interested in sharing the gospel, you, say, you may say, Brother Jared, I don't know how to share the gospel. Listen, you can go with two other experienced folks who do know how. You can sit and watch and observe and, and learn from watching them participate. All right, so I want to encourage you. We're not, we're not going <laughs> to... I'm not going to force you to go and, and do the, you know, get all that stuff out of your head and, and come and participate. And uh, let me know if I can do anything for you. You'll see here as well that we have Tennessee Missions this month. And uh, if you're curious about what the missions offering goes for, so it's a Golden State missions offering for Tennessee. 100% of it goes towards these ministries that are on the back in your bulletin. So if you're curious about where this is, you'll see, even see where it's budgeted for these various ministries. You'll see 780,000 going to planting new churches and revitalizing churches that are dying. Uh, compassion ministries. And you see disaster relief, Tennessee Hunger Fund, all those things. So almost half a million dollars goes towards that. I mean, it, it's just, I want to encourage you to read that and let us, this whole month, if you want to give towards that, just earmark your checks. Um, missions offering, you almost say missions offering, something along those lines. And we want to thank those who donated for the True Hope Helping Hands ministry. Um, how many did we have yesterday? All right, so we had 58 families come yesterday. 58 people come yesterday. Or 58 families? 58 families that came and participated yesterday and represent almost 200 people or over 200 people. Um, I want to encourage you. Thank you so much. Because you gave, and y'all, when we asked for donations, y'all really gave well. And so we, we actually had supplies that we could give folks. And so thank you so much for that. Um, but they, they heard the gospel we prayed with. And so I, I want to encourage you to continue. And perhaps the Lord may lead you to participate. We're needing, we always need workers for that ministry. And if you have any questions about that, you can see Ms. Garden Brooks or you can see Ms. Linda Ferris about that ministry. Alright, anything else? Anything I might have forgot? I forgot the yellow one, didn't I? We have a Alright, this is the cooking ministry that Miss Reba leads. It is September 15th, and this is Saturday. And you can register for that. I want to encourage you to participate in that from 9 to 12 or 1 to 3. And you have fun in casseroles. That's a Baptist party. That's the all you know right there uh, that have a Baptist party. Fried chicken. <laughs> fun in casseroles. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Those casseroles, one, they go to family. Families who actually come and cook, they get to take home those casseroles for their families. But also they're extra made for folks in need. So if somebody comes home from the hospital, we you know we provide a casserole or two to help them. You know, you know how it is when you get home. You know, you don't feel like cooking and so it, it's a ministry in both ways. So they, they actually make it extra um, so that we can minister in other ways as well. Absolutely. If you are wanting to visit someone or you know someone who could use a casserole, um, we're working on getting that. It's actually over right now in the Family Life Center. But we're actually working on moving it over here um, to where if you need a casserole and want to take it to someone, call the church office and we'll get that set up for you. That's where you can just take it and deliver it. Any other announcements? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead.
All right, let's prepare our hearts for worship the way we do that is by when we come and get it, that we need the one that we're about to sing to and about. So you've got to come with a repentant heart. So between you and the Lord, if there's any unconfessed sin, this is the time to confess it. Do you bow with me? Father, I thank you for this day and the opportunity to come and to worship you, Lord, with my brothers and sisters. I pray that you bless this service, that we would exalt you, that we would praise you, and that we would be encouraged by your truth. And by not only that, but that we're not alone in our Christian walk. Not only do we have the Holy Spirit, but you have saved others and brought them into your kingdom. And you've put us all together so that we might encourage one another and build one another up. God, I pray that we do just that and that you would be honored. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Church, won't you stand and encourage one another in the name of Jesus here this morning?
Um, he is Jesse downstairs in the nursery, but he's your deacon of the week. If you've got anything that he can help you with, uh, his number's in the, in the bulletin, as is mine. And welcome to call either one of us. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come into your house and, and hear your word and take it into our heart, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we ask that you take this offering today, Lord, and use it and multiply it in only the way that you can. Lord, we ask that you use it to, to, to enhance your kingdom and expand your kingdom. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen.
Raspberry Pi work with the microphone. So you all get to see what you get to see looking back there here. I handed this microphone, which by the way was not turned on, to Justice and his grandmother said, here go. <laughs> Play a game called, I don't know, Mikey says. You might not play that game? You ever played it before? No. Oh, I bet you have. It might be you know it by another name. What do you think, Braxton? Simon says. Oh, okay. So let's try this. Mikey says, touch your ear. I'm going to go slow, okay, so we don't, so I don't mess up. Mikey says, touch your ear. He says, touch your nose. He says, touch your ear again, and put your hand up, and wave it around. Oh, wait, my goodness. So, do you want to try it again? Oh, you, okay, good job, buddy. My teach is pour the rules. All right, so you're, not, you're only supposed to do it when I say Mikey says, right? Okay. Mikey says, hold your microphone up. You all don't have microphones. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Well, let me ask you a question. So, I was asking you to do something, and you guys did what? You, you did what I asked you to do, okay? Well, let me ask you another question. What is a disciple? This will all tie together. Y'all just stay with me. What is a disciple? Who are the disciples? Please. Let me put it that way. That they were probably disciples, but they weren't probably the original. She said the three people that gave Jesus the gifts. And they, they probably were disciples in, in one way. Okay? The ones I'm thinking about are, does anybody know one of them? With John? Who else? Uh, he's not one, but keep going. Who? Bar Bartholomew? All right, he's going. So you guys over here now. Help us out. Y'all been studying this. <coughs> Peter. Ah, what, what's special about Andrew? He was the first. Did anybody know that? How many of you have read the book of Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that's a different Bible than we read. <laughs> so Andrew was the first disciple. And a disciple is somebody who, who follows another person and he does what they tell him to do. What was special about Andrew? What's special about him, Emma? Besides the fact that he was first. Was he a great orator? Did he make great speeches? No. Did he lead big crowds of people to Jesus? No. What else? Did, did he do anything special, Mark? He was really good at bringing one person. He was really good at bringing one person at a time. So, can we be disciples? Yes, we can. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> like, oh. Yes, we can. How do we do that? How do we how do we learn how to be a disciple? Yeah, we study the Bible and we listen to your daddy, don't we? He helps us learn. So can we be disciples? How do we do that? Kind of like, I mean, the, the game Mikey's, you know, Mikey says that's a pretty silly game, but we can play a game called Jesus. Jesus says, tell people about me. And we can do that, can we? Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for it. Lord, just letting us be able to, to tell other people about you. And Lord, we know that we that as as we are, we're not we're not maybe great orators, we don't make great speeches, Lord, but we can each one of us talk to somebody else about you. Help us have the courage to do that.
10, 29 through 31 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not be afraid. And are worth more than many of you.
And so it is joyous to think through his value of us. And so we need to share that value with one another. Friends, turn your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter. We're in chapter 2, looking at verse 13 through 25. And this is a very difficult, um, very difficult text uh, to preach here this morning because it is so uh, countercultural and uh, it is counter uh, what we often want to do. Um, but we're going to wrestle with it today, and the goal is to submit to the Word of God. Particularly, the title of the sermon is Submit to God's Authority. You know, as I was studying for this sermon, I, I came across an illustration um, from a, a Korean pastor, uh, Pastor Yang Wan's son, uh, in 1948. Uh, this was right before the uh, Korean War, and the Communist China was in, invading uh, Korea, and it was torturing uh, Christians. Um, this is what he said, this pastor. He said, I thank God that he has given me the love to seek to convert and to adopt as my son the enemy who killed my dear boys. And so this was in Sunshine near the 38th parallel. A band of communists had taken control of the town for a brief period and they had executed pastor's sons, two older boys, Matthew and John. They died as martyrs calling on their persecutors to have faith in Jesus. When the communists were driven out, Cha Sun, a young man of the village, was identified as one who had fired the murderous shots. His execution was ordered. Pastor Sun requested that the charges be dropped and that Cha Sun be released into his custody for adoption. Rachel, a 13-year-old sister of the murdered boys, testified to support her father's incredible request. Only then did the court agree to release Chai's son. He became the son of the pastor and a believer in the grace of Jesus Christ. I know that, that story really struck me. I mean, I, I can't imagine um, someone coming in and killing my two oldest children. And then when those enemies are driven out of the town and the, the person who fired the shots is told to be executed, I can't imagine saying, no, I'll adopt him and he'll be my son. Um, but that is a miraculous story of God's grace um, from this pastor to this enemy who murdered his boys. But you know that, I believe that young man who killed those boys, uh, who trusted in the grace of Christ, will be in heaven with those boys that he murdered. So it's interesting that the martyr's prayers were answered. Where you had the executioner actually converted to Christianity. Trusting in Christ. And so with that story in mind and that backdrop, let us look at some ways that we can submit to God's authority here this morning. So the first point I want you to see is that we submit to God's authority by, one, submitting to our government. And you see this in verse 13 through 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Let's pray to Father, Lord, my prayer is that you would uh, teach us this morning concerning your glorious truth, concerning how all authority um, is from you. And Lord, uh, help us um, to submit to you um, when it's difficult, when we're placed in difficult situations. May your glory be our goal. And may you give us wisdom for how to navigate the very situations that may be in our future. I thank you for your grace and your love. In Christ's name, amen. So we see the first point is that we submit to our government. Notice that he commands, so that, remember that these Christians are dispersed um, throughout present-day Asia Minor. This is the first century. Rome rules the world. Caesar rules the world. Uh, that's the emperor that he refers to. Now Caesar um, claimed to be a god. So this is a, a demigod. Claimed, not, he's not really a demigod, you know, part god, part man. But he's claiming to be. All right? So many Romans worship this false god. But notice who Peter is saying that they're to submit to. They're to submit to the emperor. They're to submit to him as supreme. 
And so I want to encourage you. So in our context, it would be us submitting to our president. Whether that president, whenever our president was President Obama, Christians were supposed to submit to President Obama. And when it's President Trump now, Christians are supposed to submit to President Trump. And uh, there will be other presidents in the future. If we live long enough, there will be more presidents here, and we're to submit to those individuals. Um, again, ultimately, we're to submit to God's authority. All authority that is over us is permitted by God. And so I want to encourage you in that endeavor. We'll look at that. You may say, well, Brother Jerry, what about when the president is unjust or our leaders are unjust? So we'll, we'll talk about that here in a minute. But I'm going to read you Psalm 2, 1 through 4. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heaven laughs. The Lord, which is Adonai, holds them in derision. So God laughs at the nations who think that they can overthrow him. He is the one who is in control always, even when it appears that he is not. It's just mere human perception. So consider Paul's statement, for example, in Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So Paul argues that God is so much in control of all things that all things are from him, through him, and to him. And so with that said, I want to encourage you to turn over real quickly. So hold your place there and flip over to John chapter 19. And we're going to look at Jesus Christ's interaction with Pontius Pilate. And so look at how Jesus... Acknowledges the the authority that is over him, even though he is God the Son incarnate. So John nineteen ten through eleven, I find this very very interesting. John nineteen ten through eleven. So this is after the the arrest of Jesus. And he's standing before Pontius Pilate. In verse 10 of John 19, Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. And so notice that God is the one who gives people life and he allows them to have the power and authority that they have on earth. Consider Paul's words in Romans 13, 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. God is sovereign over all creation, including who the various leaders are in our various communities. Granted, God does not commit their sins, but they would be in no position to carry out their sins apart from Him. So think of Judas. Think of Judas' betrayal of Jesus. The only reason Judas was in a position to betray Jesus was because Jesus chose him. Yet, Judas freely chose to betray Christ. So remember, so you have free will and God's sovereignty here that are kind of they're kind of like two ropes, right? Or two tracks. You think of uh, standing on a train track, right? And how those two tracks, right? How they're side by side and... They never meet as far as we can see, but we assume that free will and God's sovereignty will meet in eternity um, somehow. Uh, but we need to emphasize both of those. Man is free and responsible and God is meticulously sovereign, so he's in control. There are some who want to say, you know, they want to put all the eggs in man's freedom. There are some who want to put it all on God and blame him. Listen, God is sovereign and man is free. We need to affirm both those realities because that's what the truth is. Every person who has ever sinned, sinned because they chose to sin. People who go to hell choose to go there. So we need to be aware of those realities. And yet, um, God permits them to make those choices. And has allowed them to make those choices. So God is meticulously sovereign. Um, Luke 22, 21 through 22. Listen to what this says. This is what Jesus says about Judas. 
But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes, it, goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. So who determined that Jesus would be crucified before the foundation of the world? God did. Who betrayed Jesus? Judas did. Jesus had to be betrayed. But woe to that man who betrays him. You have these two realities. No one forced Judas' hand. He freely chose to commit sin against Christ. Judas is responsible for betraying Jesus. Although God had determined Jesus would be betrayed, Judas still made his choice. There's, there's mystery here, but at the very least, we affirm that God is sovereign, which means he's in control of everything, and man is responsible. God is in control of all things. That's why the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, 11 through 13 could say, now this is, he's writing this from prison. The Apostle Paul from prison says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So he writes that from prison. Now if he's got Jesus in prison, he's got all that he needs even when he's in prison. Now flip back over to 1 Peter. So I just wanted to establish the Bible's teaching on the reality that God is sovereign. God is in control. And so that's the reason why this message is titled, Submit to God's Authority. Right? And not only that, but Peter says that several times in this passage. So in verse 13, we see that Peter, so we're in chapter 2, 1 Peter, verse 13. We see that Peter is commanding his readers to submit to every human institution. So his point is that every human institution is a form of authority that is granted or permitted by God. Thus we are to submit to those who are in authority over us unless they tell us to go against God, to go against his word. So Peter tells his persecuted readers to submit to the emperor. Now I want to encourage y'all, y'all go home after service today or sometime this week. Go look up. So this was probably written a little bit before Nero came on the scene. Nero is probably comparable to Adolf Hitler. Wicked, evil man, pedophile, public pedophile, understanding pedophile. One of the most evil men that I've read about in history is Nero. And he comes into power shortly after this letter is written. And so I want to encourage you, go look up Nero and consider... How this context, right, this persecution that is about to come to Christians, and consider the book of 1 Peter and the commands that are contained therein, and realize that it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing the commands that are here. But that, this is the way you usurp the authority over you. You do it with love. And that's part of what he's saying. That's how Christ, when he was being crucified by his own people and being crucified by Roman soldiers, how he usurped their authority was by laying down his law. Right? Now, I'm not saying that that's in every situation. I'm not a pacifist at all. Right? I do believe in self-defense, and I mean, we'll, we'll get into that here in a moment. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that I know will come up due to this text. Um, but I want to encourage you to reflect on the evil that is. I mean, in other words, the leaders that are ruling at this time are much worse than our leaders. Much worse. In verse 14, not only are we to submit to the highest government office in the land, we are to submit to the local governing authority as well. You see that he tells them to submit to the govern governors. Peter tells us here to submit to the emperor and the governors because God has sent them. Listen to the language that Peter uses. He says that God has sent these leaders. I mean, it's pretty strange to say, to think that God sent Nero. I mean, that, that language that is used there, it's, he's just talking about God's sovereignty. He's talking about how God, I mean, who's making Nero's heart beat in the first century? Who's making Herod's heart beat when he's killing all those children when Jesus is said to have been born? I mean, who's the one that holds every man's life in his hand? It is God. God is the one who is sovereign. And God permits life. God is the giver of life and taker of life. 
And he permits life for reasons that we don't understand. He permits situations that we don't understand. But he's God and we're not. The Bible says that he is all good. And I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. I do not understand um, everything. I don't understand why the devil was permitted to tempt Adam and Eve. Just go ahead and send him to hell already. I mean, that's what the Bible says. He's going to be cast in like a fire in Revelation. Just go ahead and do it. I'll wait till the end. Just don't do that temptation, you know? And there, there are a lot of unanswered questions. But at the end of the day, the question is, are you going to trust God or are you going to trust man? Those are your only choices. I'd rather trust God. And it's actually comforting to me that God is all good and permits evils for reasons He understands that I don't. I mean, you realize that if God did not permit evil to happen to Jesus Christ, that you could not be saved. There would be no gospel. He had to endure God's wrath for our sin. He had to become sin for us. For us to be cleansed of our sin. There had to be a human sacrifice that was worthy, sinless, able to save potentially an endless number of people. So it had to be the God man. Couldn't be just any man's blood. It had to be the God man's blood. And so in verse 15, we see that why are we to submit to the governing authorities? We're to submit to the governing authorities so that we will put to silence those who claim that Christians are rebel rousers. So think about first century Rome. You have Romans worshiping Caesar and worshiping false gods. And imagine getting saved. Imagine becoming a Christian, right? And um, you are in someone's household. Possibly you're an indentured servant. In the first century, they had indentured servants. So you would, if you were a teacher, doctor, carpenter, tutor, you would sign a contract, let's say seven, eight years, for a certain amount of money, for certain provisions provided by that household, for people. You know, you would be in their employ, in a sense. But they could be harsh towards you. It was permitted in the first century. You know, it, it was permitted by the Roman government in the first century. And so imagine being in that and, and uh, concerning uh, this persecution, really, that you'd be experiencing. And so not only that, but because you were an indentured servant, and it wasn't just indentured servants, it was indentured servants. It was also, we're again, we're talking about Roman culture. Indentured servants, slaves, and wives. Right? Now, wives were at the top. Right, they still were much less valuable than men in Roman culture. They're just, I say they're at the top. They're a little bit better than slaves in the first century. All right, again, we're talking about Roman culture. Right, just what Rome was like. All right, so Rome, imagine, let's say you're a slave, let's say you're an indentured servant, or, or you're a wife, and you get saved. You were supposed to worship the master's gods. All right, that, was, that was expected in the first century. If you were saved, if you got saved, all right, you were expected to worship the master's gods. So how do you usurp that authority? Because you, if you're a Christian, you can't worship false gods. I mean, see, that's actually the opposite of being a Christian. And so that's what they're wrestling with. And he's writing his hearers, encouraging them, encouraging them. How do they usurp that authority? How do they rebel um, and hope to see their masters converted. You know, how do they answer these false gods and these false religions? And how do they rebel against what the culture is demanding of them? And so let's get into that just briefly here. Well, before we do, I want you to consider Acts 5, where... In Acts chapter 5, the disciples are arrested. Um, they're arrested for preaching Christ. And they're ordered to stop preaching in Jesus' name or else. And in Acts 5.29, they reply, We must obey God rather than men. They preach the gospel to the governing authority. 
the governing authority beat them and released them and told them not to preach in Jesus' name anymore. And the Bible says in Acts 5, 41 through 42, that the disciples went away rejoicing and that they did not stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And so you had this rebellion against the governing authority. And not only that, but um, think of, uh, do, you, do y'all know the various scenes? So I know you, many of you are versed in the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the story of Jesus. There are many times when the Bible says that Jesus escaped. That Jesus, I don't know if he disappeared or what, <laughs> but, but if you're just reading that, there's like five or six instances in, in the Gospels that describing Jesus where he, they're, they're trying to arrest him. They try to arrest him all the time. But the Bible says like he escaped. Like is he Houdini or something. You know? um, but I mean he escapes. He weaves his way somehow through the crowd. And you know it's a God thing. It's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's probably miracles honestly. Um, but you have Jesus. Now that's, that's a rebellion against governing authority. Right? He didn't allow them to arrest him until it was time. The Bible says. Not only that, but you look at Acts and you see that Peter is being let out of windows. You see Paul is being, they're they're escaping from captors. I mean, there there are times when they flee, when they run away from the authority. So again, this is not cut and dry. What I want you to see is what we're looking at is something peculiar to 1 Peter's readers. Right? My opinion is they were in a situation where they could not escape. So if I was writing, let's say I wrote a, a letter to Christians in North Korea. What do you tell Christians who cannot escape their situation? What do you tell them? <coughs> you tell them to escape? No, what, what he's telling them. So let's look at what he says to them. All right, we'll continue here. We see in verse 16 that we're to submit to God. He says that we're to live as free men and women. Where we are free, God has freed us from the commandments of men. Free to serve the Lord of creation and the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ. And so to use that freedom to submit to the governing authorities over us is what he's arguing. And then verse 17, he says that we're to honor everyone. So whatever authority that's over us, think of jobs, think of schools. You know, teach, uh, children, think of submitting to your teachers. Think of submitting to your parents. Think of submitting to your bosses at your jobs, your vocations. We should love humanity. He says, love the brotherhood. And I believe that's a reference to God's image bearers, loving males and females, loving all humanity in a way that we do not love angels and animals. And we're also to fear God, which will lead us to honor the authorities He has placed over us, including the emperor. In our context, would be the president. And so the first point you see is that we submit to God's authority by submitting to the government. The final point I want you to see is that we submit to God's authority by submitting to our masters. And so look at verse 18. He says, servants. Now this would be the indentured servants. Right, so this is the word, the Greek word here is not slaves. The Greek word here is indentured servants, people who voluntarily um, submitted to someone, signed a contract, and said, I'll serve you for however long. Uh, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. But this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin or beaten for it, you endure it? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his words you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep that have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Now, verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect. 
Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Again, I believe this is referring to a particular situation where uh, Christians could not escape. They could not appeal to the governing authorities. Um, I realize that in American history, um, that Christians have used this to justify slavery. American shall tell slavery, um, the ownership and abuse of people based on race, um, which is part of our dark, wicked history of this country. And um, I believe that this was used by many Christians to justify, I know you're supposed to submit, I mean Christians would use this to justify slavery. Friend, I don't believe you can justify slavery, especially American shuts out slavery. I don't believe that you can justify the ownership and abuse of another human being based on their skin color. Now, people want to point at Israel and say, look at Israel. Listen, Israel was a peculiar people of God. Now, in Israel, it is true that slavery was um, regulated. But what you have in Israel is God's peculiar people. And what you have in Canaan, you realize that Canaan, Canaan was to be heaven on earth. The promised land. They, I mean, you go back and you read the covenant. When they're about to enter Canaan, they were to be perfect. Perfect. And so it literally, the people who were enslaved were literally God's enemies. And God's holiness was peculiarly associated with Israel in Canaan. To where enslaving God's enemies was actually permitted at that time by Israel. We're not Israel. This is not heaven on earth. There is something new that has come with Jesus Christ. And his kingdom is not of this world, but one day it will be. So we cannot use Israel, something peculiar to Israel, something peculiar to Canaan, the enslaving of God's enemies, to justify immorality in America. Now I realize this, it's not cut and dry. This really needs to be like ten sermons. But I want to encourage you to go back and read. So you think of the Canaanite cleansing. You realize that God commanded Israel to go in and kill everyone, even the animals, to wipe, to clean it. I mean, that, that's a very difficult thing to wrestle with, but you have. And the reality is, is that who gives life and who takes it? Who's the only person, the only one, who has the right to give life and take it? God. Right? And so God commanded His people, who His holiness is peculiarly associated with, His name is associated with, to execute His judgment, His wrath on a people, to bring heaven to earth. Where in order to get to Yahweh, you realize in, in Israel, the only way to get to Yahweh was how? You had to go through Israel. You had to go and become a proselyte. You had to go and be grafted into Israel. And something with Christ is that something new and amazing is that we go directly to Him. We don't go through a nation. We go directly to Him. He is the high priest. We don't go through it. I mean, He's the ultimate fulfillment of that reality. And so I, I believe, biblically, that that was never to be repented. What went on in first century, what was considered moral, um, what was considered moral, not first century, what was considered moral in Israel, in Canaan, would not be considered moral for us. And I'm not saying moral relativism. I'm saying that they were in a different situation than we are in. That heaven on earth, they were to be perfect. And actually, you realize that eventually God's wrath is poured out in, on His own people. Because it wasn't heaven on earth. Because they failed miserably. In other words, they needed Jesus. They needed Jesus. And so I've just seen that. I want to encourage you, if you ever get time, go back and look at some of the Southern Baptist history and the debates that went on in the South. You had Southern Baptists who were opposing slavery publicly. And in the state newspapers, a lot of them are still in existence today, 
um, like the like the Baptist Reflector, Tennessee's, and um, but you can go back and read articles where where Southern Baptist leaders were at each other's throats over the issue of slavery, and they were some were justifying it, and some were saying it was wrong, um, but they would use verses like this to justify. It. Listen, this 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 verse does not justify slavery. This verse is written in a particular context. And I believe if you, if you cannot escape, if there's no hope for you to escape, this is how, listen, this is how you turn the system on its head. You do it with love. You do it with grace. Notice what he says in verse 19. This is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. Hey, let, let me be clear here. I'm saying if you can escape an unjust situation, escape. And I believe I can prove that biblically. I believe it's our responsibility to call on the government to protect the innocent. That institution is to hold them accountable too. And so if you can escape an unjust situation, don't, let, don't just take one verse and run with it. But realize that this is a particular context. That is going on here. Now, if you can't escape, if you're in a situation you don't believe you can escape from, see, I, I believe we have a responsibility to protect the image of God in us and to protect the image of God in our children. And so if there's an abusive husband, I believe wives should, should get out. Uh, I believe uh, abuse. Husbands, if you're abusing your wives, I believe you have abandoned your wives. Um, I believe they can biblically divorce you. For it. I believe it's a form of abandonment. You may be in the home, but you have testified that you're not a believer in Christ. So I say that to say, unless, yes, there is mercy for those who have been abused. But wives, I want you to know that I believe you're free in Christ to leave husbands like that. I don't believe you have to submit to men like that. And I believe I can prove that from the Bible. But it's a gracious thing when mindful of God one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin you are beaten for it, you endure? When you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So basically, because of Christ's example who was beaten and crucified unjustly, we need, when we're in situations like that that we cannot escape, we need to submit to God by pouring out grace on those who are hurting us. And friend, there are countless testimonies um, in church history where people have been converted, where, where abusers have been saved, um, where um, you know, prison guards have been converted who tortured Christians, and Christians poured out grace on them. And it transformed their hearts. Holy Spirit used it to change them. And so, in verse 19, when Christians submit to their unjust employers, they are showing grace to them. And Peter bases Christians showing grace on being mindful of God. Notice in verse 19, he refers to being mindful of God. So, so ultimately, when you submit to unjust folks, so if you're in a situation you can't get out of, and you're submitting to an unjust person, you're not submitting to them. You're submitting to God. And that, that's what will free you. They may think that you're their property or you're their slave. But the reality is, God's freed man or freed woman is nobody's slave but God's. So He frees you. He frees you in an awful situation to love those. And, and really, it boils down to how much God loves you. I mean, think, think about our rebellion against God and how abusive we have been towards God. How unjust we have treated God. And you know how God has responded to us? He's poured out His grace and love on us. And so, out of that well, that endless well of unending love and grace, you draw from and you seek to pour it out on others who may treat you unjustly. And again, I believe it's a, if it's a situation that you're, you cannot escape. You see in verse 21 through 24, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in His steps. 
He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And so in God's sight, it's gracious to suffer for doing good. Christ suffered for doing good. He committed no sin, but was treated like a sinner on the cross. He wasn't deceitful. He did not execute revenge. But instead, any person who repents and believes, if those Roman soldiers repent and believe, they're in heaven today, right? If those Roman soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross, or any of those Jews who were shouting, crucify him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the thieves, plural, go back and read it, the thieves, plural, were ridiculed at Jesus before he was crucified. Or maybe during the crucifixion. And then you learn that later on, several hours later, one of the thieves repents and believes in Christ. And so, he, so someone who was shouting, crucifying her, who was making fun of Jesus, is converted. I believe he's in heaven with Christ. Because Christ told him, today you'll be in paradise. And so when Christ suffered, he did not threaten. But instead he trusted himself to his Father's sovereignty. You know what? There's great freedom in that. There's great freedom in trusting God. Knowing that no one can touch you unless he permits it. In verse 24, we see Christ bore our sins so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And you see in verse 25 that before we came to Christ, we were like sheep going astray. But we've returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And so friends, I want to encourage you, based on the caveats that have been presented, the way that we submit to God's authority is by submitting to our government and submitting to our masters. And to summarize I would say you submit to the, the government, you submit to your masters until they tell you to go against God's word and violate your conscience. And there are numerous examples we could, we could look at. Um, and I just don't believe it's a cut and dry issue. I believe it's a situation issue. If you ever have any questions about how to respond to a specific situation, please come see me and we'll wrestle with the scriptures together. But friends, let us respond how God may be leading here this morning. I want you to know that if you repent and believe, you will be saved. Though you and I have done great harm to God in rebellion against Him, He gave His only Son for us to pour out grace on us. And friend, that grace is free. You can't earn it, but it's been offered. And if you will repent and believe, He will save you. On the flip side of that, friends, I, I want to encourage you, those who are believers, to think about how much the Bible opposes revenge. To think about how much the Bible is against revenge. Now listen, let me be clear here. Um, you know, several, it's been about seven years ago, my, uh, my cousin was brutally killed in uh, Sparta. Actually, Brother Randy helped, helped get her uh, murderers prosecuted. And... Um, I want the state to do its job and punish those evildoers. And I want those people to repent and believe in Christ and be in heaven with me. Those two realities are not opposed. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. The government is to punish evildoers and the gospel is to save folks. So, friend, how will we respond here today? As Brother Kenny comes and leads us in the end of invitation, let's all stand. I want to invite you to come pray. I want to invite you to come and trust in Jesus. You can be saved today. Consider this song, I'd rather have Jesus.
for your time. Um, I want to encourage you to go study these subjects. And uh, remember to sign up for our visitation ministry. Remember our training tonight. We have worship at 6, continuing to march through Jesus' life. And then at 7, from 7 to 7.30, we're going to be discussing about how to share the gospel. Miss Linda's going to be teaching us. And um, remember, next Sunday, that week, is when we start our visitation. So you'll get a bag next Sunday. It's Team Leader Wilson. And with a list of contacts that you're supposed to contact that week with your team. Uh, but please sign up there before the you head out or towards the Sunday school office. Um, parents, don't forget catechism. Uh, remember to do your catechism with your children. Um, I think that is, uh, I, it's kind of like learning from the ant, right? You want to teach your kids the Bible? Best way to do it is a little bit here and there. And uh, they're like steel traps. So I want to encourage you to find it on the app. We can find it online. I'm going to turn it over to Brother Michael. Uh, again, keep in mind, even the activities, the youth can be here at 5. Um, a little bit of a change. Uh, the youth, 530, 545, will be coming over here. And then we're going to be baptized in uh, Houston uh, this, this evening. So we're going to have that um, at the beginning of the service. I encourage you to come be a part of that. Uh, make sure and plan and send that to encourage him and his family. We'll start off the service that way tonight, uh, and then after that, we'll go back and, and have our time together. Any other announcements? Uh, you want to, uh, uh, thank you for praying for my dad uh, this past week, um, a week ago today. Uh, they thought he had another heart attack, um, but he just got out of rhythm. He got an uh, Wednesday, they were able to shock him back into a normal rhythm. He got to come home on Thursday. So thank you for your prayers for him. Uh, he had a massive heart attack in 2011. Um, they told him that he wouldn't make it a year. He's still around. Uh, today, he's sitting in his choir at his church with 8% function in his heart. Um, see? And uh, it's by the grace of God. Praise the Lord. And thank you for, thank you for your prayers. And I'd like to thank our staff. Uh, total support this week. As I've been driving back and forth, thank you so much, and Zach, for covering for my classes. It's just, I'll let you know how that is when family is not doing everything, it's kind of thrown up in there. And I appreciate everybody. Any other announcements? Before we pray? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this day. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to come to your house this morning to worship you with our church family. And Father, we thank you for each individual here for what they add to our church. Father, we thank you for the message that we heard here today. Father, we pray that this week you'll put people in our path on purpose so we can share the gospel with them. Father, above all else, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who gives hope to every situation. It's in the strength of his name we pray. Amen. Amen.